Hello, so in this lecture, we'll be going through how we can create a self-driving agent by making use of the Carla simulator as well as deep learning networks. So this lecture is going to be split into two, where the first part will go through the theory of what we're trying to do, and the second part will go through the code so that you learn how to create such an agent by yourself. And the reasoning behind this lecture is that we want to use all the knowledge we've acquired so far in the deep learning series and the reinforcement learning series to work on an interesting problem here. So having said that, let's actually get started. So the problem setup is as follows. We are given a car in an environment that we set up by making use of the car simulator. So what we do is we attach a camera to that car so that it collects images and by using those images, we're going to learn how to steer or navigate in that environment. So let me make that clearer. So the idea is we're given an input image, right? We're given an input image. What we do is we're going to process that image. And I will show you how we're going to do that later on. And then we feed it into some neural network. Right, so here we have our image, we process it, we fit it into some neural network, and basically we output some steering commands, right? That, that is basically the process here. So as you can imagine, there are certain limitations we're imposing on ourselves here because we're just learning from the image itself but there's a lot of data that we can actually learn from when we're actually building the self-driving car agents. But in this case, we just want to see how far we can go by just using images, right? So having said that, let me actually explain this further, right? So we were saying we're outputting some steering commands, right? So imagine uh, the maximum degrees that we can turn to the left is minus one, and the maximum we can turn to the right is plus one, right? And if we don't turn at all, so this is essentially zero, right? So the maximum we can turn to the right is plus one, the maximum we can turn to the left is minus one, and if we don't turn at all, it's zero, and we can actually turn various degrees between zero and one, right? That's the, that's the idea, to the right, and zero and minus one to the left, right? So this, this is essentially our steering here. Yeah? So this is actually representing our action space, right? Where the maximum action is plus one and the minimum is minus one. But since we are making use of deep Q learning networks, that means we have to discretize this action space because as we know, with deep Q learning networks, the output are just Q values of a state and action, right? So we're already forced to discretize. So let me write that down here. So we have to discretize the action space. So we'll have something like plus or minus, let's say 0 0.75, plus or minus 0 0.5, plus or minus 0 0.25, and maybe plus or minus 0 0.1 and zero. Something like this could represent essentially our actions, right? after they're discretized. So already we have our state that's being represented by the input image. Then we have our network that does the learning and our actions which have been discretized to take those values, right? So this is it, this is our setup. So the next thing as in any reinforcement learning problem, we decided to, de to define our state, we defined our actions, we need to define our reward function, right? So this is where a lot of interesting things can happen. So let's define our reward function. So how we design, design our reward function is going to be very important because it actually controls whether we can learn efficiently or not. Of course, that's not to diminish the like design of the action space or the state as well. 
but it's just something you should keep in mind. So the first thing is to design our reward function, we're going to look at the angle between the car orientation or oh, let's just say the yaw and the road tangent, right? So let's say we define this as theta, right? And then the second component of our reward function would be the distance between the car and the road, right? And let's just call this D. And the third component of our reward function is whether there's a collision or not. And we represent that by C. So what's the idea here? So we want the angle between the car orientation and the road tangent to actually be very small. We want the distance between the car and the road to actually be very small. And we want to avoid collisions in the environment as we'll see later on. So let's actually describe this, these components of the reward function even further. So the first thing is, okay, fine. Let's say we're given our road here. So we have our road. Okay, this is our road. And let's say this is, okay, let's first say this is the road tangent here, yeah? right? And then we have our car. Let's say our car is oriented in this way, right? This is the orientation of our car. So this is our car oriented in this way. And if we actually project the orientation of this car, we'll see that it's actually oriented in this manner, right? So this is the angle between our road tangent and the car. So this is the th theta we're talking about, right? So we want this theta to be as small as possible. So how do we represent it in as a component in our reward function, right? So we can say, we can just take, let's say, um, lambda one. Okay, let me not write this here. Let's say lambda one times cosine of theta to represent our, re our reward function for this component. Uh, so what is lambda 1 in this case? Lambda 1 is just some weight that determines how important this component is and we're going to go through that in a moment. But the idea here is we're taking the cosine of theta here. And why are we doing that? So if you look at this graph here, so let's say we have a, let's use a different color here. This is our cosine graph. Right, that's how it looks, and so on. So this is the graph for cos theta, right? Where this is, let's say, 2 pi, this is pi, this is pi over 2, and this is 0, right? So the idea is, if we're trying to move in this direction, in the direction of the road tangent, right? So if we look at cosine of 0, the cosine of 0 is 1, right? So that means in a perfect situation where the car is oriented in the same direction that it's supposed to be going in, um, then the reward is one, right, in that case. But let's say the car is oriented 90 degrees, right? So if it's oriented 90 degrees, then the reward is zero, right? If it's oriented in the opposite direction, it's minus one and so on. So that means this function, by the way, lambda one here would be should be greater than one. So let me just write like this, greater than one. It has to be greater than, no, sorry, greater than zero, not greater than one. It should be greater than zero. Uh, or it can be zero if you want, but the point is it shouldn't be negative or anything. So 
the idea here is that fine we are given this angle between the road tangent and where the vehicle is oriented and this reward function component is just showing us that we care more about like we give higher rewards rather when the vehicle is oriented in the same way as where we're trying to go right that's essentially what this component is doing right so having said that let's look at the second com component of the reward function so again this one is easier to understand because we have our road here and okay so we have our car let's say our car in this okay let me use a different color again our car is here versus um our car being let's say over there which is outside the road so what we do is usually by using the color simulator we can set up certain points here right that are known as so these are known as waypoints which again i'll describe later so if you don't understand right now that's perfectly fine and basically what this reward function is saying is okay if the car is on the road basically it's as close to these waypoints as possible if it's away from the road right like this distance d is much will be much larger right so we want d to be as small as possible that, that's the idea right we want the distance between the car and the road to actually be as small as possible that's the only idea here behind this actually this second component of the reward function and the final component is just a collision component which says that if we collide we want uh, to actually negatively reflect on the reward uh, and if we're not colliding then all, all is well and fine right so we will see how adjusting the parameters of the reward function and so on might actually affect how we navigate the road and such and such so the reward function itself looks as follows so r is equal to so let's actually write it here so it's going to be lambda one cosine of theta right so we have lambda one cosine of theta minus lambda two right we take lambda two multiplied by d right minus lambda three times c right so if the angle is small this component will be high if the distance is high this will negatively reflect on the reward function and if this compo if there's a collision that will also negatively re uh, like reflect on the reward function so that's the idea here so this is how we define our reward So the inspiration behind the design for this reward function, I uh, got it through a paper that I'm going to link in the description. So if you're interested, please, you can uh, take a look at that paper as well and uh, see what they did. So it's just a slightly modified version of that, of their reward function anyway. Okay, so we've now we have our we've defined our state we've defined our action space and we've defined our actions we've defined our reward function with its different components and here we're saying lambda one lambda two and lambda three we can just set these values to show how important each component of this reward function is so manually setting this as you can imagine is actually a, a bit are difficult for you to de determine but there is also a section a, a certain branch of reinforcement learning that is called inverse reinforcement learning where we actually try to learn the reward function right uh, by using some collected data or whatever and we're actually going to look at that of course in future lectures uh, but in this case we're just going to manually set the parameters for lambda 1 lambda 2 and lambda 3 to uh, using like intuition or whatever what we feel like uh, would be appropriate ways i suppose uh, for the reward function based on what we're trying to achieve right uh, so we'll actually get to that later on so the next thing we need to talk about is 
the image processing part, right? Because what I mentioned here, what I mentioned above there was that, well, the first part is we send an input image to, uh, to our network, but before doing that, we process it somehow, and then we go through the steering commands or whatever that the image outputs, right? So how does the image processing bit actually look like, right? So first of all, we are going to be given This is what we're going to be given, our input image, like so, right? This is our input image. So the dimensions are going to be 600 by 800 by 3, right? Because it's the color image. So if you've been following our convolutional neural network lectures, you would know what this is because each bit here will have RGB channels and so on. Uh, I'm not going to go through this now since uh, you can just watch the deep learning series convolutional neural network lecture. Uh, if you want to know more about this image processing stuff. So what we do is we convert this to grayscale, right? We convert this image to grayscale and by doing that, we end up with an image with one channel, right? Of size 800 by 600, right? So after converting this image to grayscale, we're going to perform a resizing operation, right? Where we resize the image to be, let's say, 128 by 128, right? That's the idea here. And then after resizing the image, the next thing we do is, so here are the values, the values here, they are between 1 and 255, right? So what we do is, we divide this uh, by 255 and we remain with another image here of size 128 by 128. So we divide by 255 and we have image in the range of values of 0 to 1. And then as the final processing stage, we normalize this image, right? We normalize it. Uh, with a mean of 0 0.5 and a standard deviation of 0 0.5. And we end up with our final image, which is 128 by 128. And it has values between minus 1 and plus 1, right? This is the value range of the image, right? So this, th these are the steps that we take to process the image itself. So it's not that complicated. Um, and we're going to see how we're actually doing that through the code. So essentially, fine, we've explained a couple of parts already. So we've explained that we have an input image, how we pro process it, uh, and then we feed it into some neural network, which outputs the steering commands, which will be discretized to be between, like, let's say, plus or minus 0 0.75, uh, 0 0.5, and so on, as we see here. Now, the next bit we need to talk about is the neural network itself, the architecture and everything, right? So we've already looked at deep Q learning networks. Uh, so I'm not actually going to go into detail about them, but there is a lecture about that. Uh, so you can take a look at it from the reinforcement learning series. But I'm going to just show you how we can actually do this. Okay, so we're going to go through the architecture. Okay, so the first thing we need to define is our, let's say, environment. Okay, we define our environment here. Okay, and then we're going to define if uh, okay, let's use a different color for this. This will be our behavior network. All right, this will be our behavior network. So let's say it's like so. 
and so on. So this is essentially our behavior network. And then we'll also define what we called, mm, let me use, here we have another network, which is a copy of the behavior network in this case, and this will be our target network, right? Okay, so that's the idea here. So now what we know is that, let's actually define what we call the, um, the inference loop, right? Because what would happen is that in the environment, we would send a state S, which is essentially an image in our case, right? And then we feed, it, we feed this into the network and the network outputs, what does the network output? It outputs what action we're supposed to take. Well, technically it outputs the Q values, but from those Q values, we can actually determine what output we're taking, right? So it's some policy, right? Parameterized by data of a given S, right? It can be some epsilon greedy type of policy that we output and that's fine. So we have our behavior network and we have our environment and by this we have defined our inference loop. And I'm calling it an inference loop because that's what we do during inference. Like after we've trained our network and everything, we're looking at the environment, we feed in the state and the behavior network outputs like an action, right? And that's fine. But now when we are actually training our network, so the first thing uh, we need to think about is fine. Here we're going to have we're gonna have let's say this samples for the okay. So we're going to have a replay buffer. So if you remember from the deep key learning networks, uh, we define this uh, replay buffer uh, so that we can like try to maintain that IID, IID assumption as much as possible. So having said that, we have this replay buffer and when we're training, what do we do? So from the environment, right, we send the following tuple. We send our state, action, reward, and next state tuples to the replay buffer, right? And during training, right, what we do is as feeding into the network, we actually sample from this replay buffer, right? Uh, we sample and we send it to our behavior network, right? And it uses this information also to compute the loss. And of course, uh, basically, because since we're sampling like S, comma A, comma R, comma S prime, like some of it is also used to evaluate uh, the things in the target network. So if you remember, when we're given a behavior network, our output is essentially, so if we're looking at our output here, let me just use this notion for output, it's, Q of S comma A parameterized by theta, right? And our output in this network, in the target network is Q S comma A parameterized by theta prime. So essentially what this is, is that usually theta prime is an earlier version of theta, right? like uh, because we try to have that operation in between the behavior and the target network whereby every t iterations or every t steps we're actually copying the network parameters uh, between the behavior network and the target network right so here oh this is still part of the training loop so there is a copy iteration every our steps 
right? There's a copy iteration between the behavior network and the target network. And I'm not going to go into detail about this because once again, I explained how this works uh, in the deep Q learning network lecture. Uh, so again, you can just take a look at that if you're interested, right? So we do this copy of operation. And after doing that, we use all of this information, right? This information, this output from here. Okay, let me use a different color now. Um, which one have we not used yet? Well, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but there we go. So we use the output from here. Oh, wait, I forgot one more component that we need here, which is also the reward, right? We also need the reward here, right? So we take this component, right? We take this component and we take this component and we use all of this to compute our loss, right? We use all of this to compute our loss. So that's essentially the network architecture, right? Of how we're actually doing training. So essentially this is, uh, most of the stuff that's in orange is part of our training loop, right? So the training loop is the stuff that you see in orange and uh, the inference loop is also the stuff here. Oh, probably should have used a different color there, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You get the idea. So, and if you remember, the loss we're trying to minimize is given by R plus the maximum over all actions, right, of Q of S prime comma A parameterized by theta prime, right? This is a different theta in earlier version of theta. Like in the last lecture, we represented theta prime by using theta of T minus one, but you get the idea, right? minus q of s comma a parameterized by theta right so if you remember this was essentially this here was essentially our error right where this was this component here in green this was our target and this component here was our prediction right which is why we have a different target network uh, for this computation and a different prediction network. And this was uh, just to avoid the idea of chasing our own tail, uh, if you remember that from the uh, like last uh, deep key learning lecture. So now we have described what the network architecture looks like. So the next thing we need to describe are the parameters, right? Okay, so part of what I'm going to talk about here is what actually makes all of this very difficult to train or to begin with, right? So let's actually look at this. So there are a lot of important factors that come into play when we are designing our reinforcement learning networks and whatever. But one thing, okay, we need to actually take care of is as follows. So when we're talking about, let's say, from the reinforcement learning side and from the neural network side, we see that, fine, first of all, we need to make sure that we have an appropriate state representation, right? We've already talked about that. Our state representation in this case is just an image, but for instance, when you are actually turning and stuff like that, uh, it's actually very important uh, for you to know what speed you're moving at and so on. And I forgot to mention this, but I should probably do that now. So let's go back to this part, whereby we are moving eight a, so a target speed of 30 kilometers per hour. So by this, we just implement a, a simple PID that just moves at a constant velocity of 30 kilometers per hour and so on, right? So that's the idea here. Well, fair enough. So our state representation is important. Here we're just using an image, but we should use way more information if you want much more smoother driving and so on, right? And we need to define our reward function, right? And the different ways we can define our reward function, not only the components of the reward function, but the weights that we give those components, right? That's also like very important in this case, how we re represent our action space. 
So in our case, we represented our action space by using these discrete values because we're implementing a DQN. But as we learn more about, um, let's say, policy gradient methods, uh, we'll see that we can have a continuous action space as well. Um, and that might work better for this problem. And we have to decide on a lot of things. Let's say the discounting term, right? How much should we discount? Uh, the copy operation here, right? Because again, this is some kind of hyperparameter as well, because we have to decide how many uh, steps should we take before we make this copy operation for smoother learning, right? So, and there's epsilon that we use for exploration versus exploitation. Maybe you want to use a decaying value of epsilon, which means that it starts as a high value and eventually uh, becomes a lower value, right? And another thing we need to determine is like our replay buffer, right? So again, what is the size of the replay buffer? What is the type of replay buffer? Because there are different ones, you know, and uh, uh, like how, how frequently should we sample from the replay buffer or whatever this thing, right? So, and there's also the idea behind like the troubles with off policy learning as well as function approximation and so on. Right. And that's just from the reinforcement learning side and from the, of course, neural network side, we need to decide on the architecture, right? Which is essentially like, let's say number of layers, number of layers of neurons and so on, right? We need to decide on this. We need to decide on the correct optimizer, right? We need to decide on the learning rate. Uh, we need to decide on the activation function and so on. So as you can see, there are so many components that we need to be able to control and we need to be, under, be able to understand how each of this would actually affect our learning process, which is why it's important uh, for you to have at least uh, to gain that understanding, maybe by going through our deep learning series or reinforcement learning series, right, to know like how you can modify this network to achieve whatever you want it to achieve. Um, but that's the idea here. So. Given all these things we need to actually like optimize for, uh, we are actually going to go through the code itself. And uh, so, yeah, let's actually uh, get to that uh, just now. So now we'll go through the code to actually develop our self-driving agent. And the code itself is not that complicated. Um, the most challenging part will be trying to find the most optimal parameters to make our agent learn something. Now, there are a lot of moving parts here, but the thing that we just want to capture is that there is an environment that we're creating by using the color simulator. And I would highly recommend you to look at the color documentation if you want to understand how the simulation itself is working much better, as I'll just give a high level overview of that, because as usual, our main focus is on how we are creating the agent because we are mostly focused on those algorithms. But if you're interested in me actually doing a tutorial for that, uh, creating a color simulator and such, I can do that in time. So having said that, let's actually get started. So let, let's first look at the pseudocode that we discussed before when we are doing uh, deep Q learning with experience replay because that's exactly what we'll be doing. So we initialize a memory of size D, uh, sorry, a memory of size N. And so this is our replay memory. And then we just do the standard stuff that we always do when we're encountering any reinforcement learning problem. We initiate our episode, we initiate our time steps, and with the probability of epsilon, we select a random action. Otherwise, we select the maximum all, over all actions of our Q values, right? And then we execute the actions, we observe our reward and next state, right? So we get the transition, state, action, reward, and next state. And we take this transition and we store it in our replay memory. So that's what we do here. So having done that, the next thing is after, let's say, storing a number of transitions in there, we can now sample random mini batches of transition from our replay memory. And the reason we're learning this way is because we do not want our network to learn from data that is correlated. Um, there is the assumption of IID that our optimizers usually make, so they learn better when we are actually 
randomly sampling these mini batches rather than just learning directly from these transitions. So we had already talked about that before, but um, like I was just, this was more or less of a recap as we're now actually implementing this thing. So as we said, our replay buffer needs to have two functionalities. So the first one was to store this transition in D and the second one is to sample a random mini batch of transitions from D. And that's what we do. We initialize our replay buffer here. We've got our state dimension, our batch size, our buffer size, the device and so on. So these are just parameters. You don't need to worry about this. But the thing you need to capture here is that, okay, we have an add functionality here. We can add a state, an action, an next state reward and done. Done just means whether the episode is done or not. Uh, as that also affects how we actually update our Q values. And then, so we had an add functionality and a sample functionality and the sample sampling, we essentially choose like a uh, random mini batches from this buffer and we return those. Uh, that's essentially what the sampling function is doing. And that's it. So we have our replay buffer. Next, we need to create our network. So we've already talked about how to create convolutional neural networks, which is what we're using here. And our input channels uh, is like, okay, we're using grayscale images. So this is just one. And then we've got 32 kernels here, 64 and 64. And that's the idea. And the only new thing that we have is this batch normalization, which I just used to speed up the training process. Um, but you don't need to worry about this now. I'll talk about it in more detail later on. Uh, but that's the only new thing uh, compared to like the last time that I showed you what a convolutional neural network looks like. And the rest of the things are pretty standard, right? So using this network, we input an image and the output should be what action should we take from that state like we discussed before. That's the point of this network. So now we look at our deep Q learning network, right? So what it does is it initializes the Q network, which is our behavior network, as we described before. Then we have a target network, uh, which we also described before, right? And we initialize an optimizer. We have our discount. We have our target update frequency, which is just how often do we actually update our target network, right? And we, again, we just talked about that. And then these are just like other parameters, like we are using a decaying epsilon, which means epsilon in the beginning is one and at the end is 0 0.05 and so on. So that in the beginning, the uh, network or the agent is taking more explorative actions. But as we train further and further, we are focusing more on exploitation than exploration. That's the idea behind this initial high value of epsilon and uh, lower value towards the end. So now we need to know how we select our actions, right? So to select our actions, the idea is that we are given a state and with a random probability. So if this random number between zero and one is greater than epsilon, uh, what are we supposed to do? We take the ag max, right? Over all actions in our state. Otherwise we return a random action, right? So this is just, uh, this is just implementing like our epsilon greedy approach here. Right. So I'm not going to uh, go through the very details of the reshape and the unsqueeze here, uh, which is just adding an extra dimension um, because like these are more PyTorch related operations, but I just want you to get the idea of what's happening uh, in this part of the code. So now we're training. What's the training process? Like we said before, we s randomly sample from our replay buffer right? And then we compute the target Q, right? So this is our target, which is reward plus the discount times the Q value of the next state, right? So, and as we can see, we take the maximum of those Q values, right? As this was described, uh, this is what we described in our formula. So the formula is here, where we say R plus gamma times the maximum of all actions of Q ST plus one, uh, comma a prime right so this is essentially what we have on this line here right and the current q is just our current uh like q value 
and then we compute the loss between the current Q and the target Q because again, as we discussed, this is the loss we're trying to minimize. And we do the standard stuff, we initialize our gradients and our optimizers or whatever, and uh, we do what we need to do. And the only other part we need to look at is the copy target update because um, every, let's say, T iterations, we are trying to like update our target network to take the parameters of our like behavior network, which we also described, right? So that's all fair and fine. So having said that, we actually have discussed how we can create our model, how we can create the DQN, uh, how we can essentially train it. Uh, so we've seen the difference between this pseudocode, or not difference, but rather the translation of this pseudocode into the code that we're actually given here. And it should be pretty clear from there, right? So that's essentially how our agent is going to learn. So let's actually look at the environment, right? The simulation environment that we are developing color, right? So first of all, I should let you know, I forgot to mention this, but these are actually our action values. So they're between minus 0 0.75 to 0 0.75 and a few values in between there uh, to actually uh, decide how much we should steer to the left or to the right. That's the idea behind this, right? So here we've talked about that. So now with our simulation, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to, okay, it's fine. We're trying to create this world, right? And these are now more color specific things. So not just to like bore you, I'm just gonna try to like give you a high level overview. We create our world. So in this world, I unloaded a bunch of like layers in the map. Uh, to make it uh, a simpler case for us to learn from. And then there are spawn points, which is just where we're actually trying to spawn our car and everything, right? So I'm not gonna focus a lot on this. So the idea here is that we create our vehicle, right? We, are, we create a camera, we attach the camera to the vehicle, and um, this is a different camera that I created with different parameters just so that I could visualize better. Um, but you don't have need to worry about that. The idea is that we create a camera and we create a collision sensor, right? And after creating a camera, collision sensor, and we have a speed controller that ensures that we are moving at a, let's say, a maximum speed of, let's say, 30 kilometers per hour. I think that was the parameter I was using. So the idea here is fine. In the environment, we want to generate an episode, right? So what we do, is let me get, go to this we get our state our state is essentially a, a processed, processed image so we just call this function process image and it processes in the same way that i described before uh, the image itself and then so that is our state right so this is our state and our action we get our action from our model itself right that's the most important part and we'll get the steer command, right? So there's an action map here that like uh, tells us like for the different indices, what steer command should we use, right? So we get the steer command from here and then this control uh, just, this is controlling like the speed that we're moving at. So you don't have to worry about that. So again, I'm just giving a high level overview of the what's actually happening here. But for you to really understand in detail, you need to look at the color documentation, or I can do a tutorial later on, and that's fine. So the important parts we need to get is what our state is, and that's a processed image, right? It's just next state here, but it's just the processed image here. And our action, we get that from our model, and then we, the, we need to maintain the same speed. And then the reward, I created uh, functions for like computing the reward from the simulator itself. And the main point is that we're gonna have the course of the angle that we discussed before. We're gonna have our distance and whether the car collided or not. And the reward will be essentially lambda one times the first parameter, which is the, that course of the angle, minus lambda two times the distance and minus lambda three times the collision. And I chose the values of lambda of one, one and five, right? So depending on the values of lambda that you choose, 
like the car could behave like differently. So what happens when we initiate the color simulator, so let me actually do that, is we get this world here that is shown here. This is essentially the world that we get by initializing the simulator. So it's moving a bit uh, slowly here uh, because probably a lot of things running. But that's the idea behind the simulator. So now I'm just going to show you like how the well the evaluation goes because I trained this model for around seven to eight hours or so um, and like I have different versions of the models that I just want to show you so that you just get an idea of uh, how the how it's working so the first model here was after 4400 episodes and let me run it so let's run the color simulator that side and we'll run it from here let's see Hopefully it doesn't crash because I have a lot of things running I should shut down, but okay, let's go Okay, so this is the first agent after 4400 episodes as you can see it's quite wobbly But it still learned where to make the correct turns and the way it's driving is really kind of wild if you think about it Okay, we're starting from a new position. Let's see what happens now So still the way it's driving is a bit Right, so this can this is also affected, of course, by our action space, right? Uh, if we choose values that are like, well, I mean, our discrete discretized action space is like is already quite small, but this can also affect like uh, our control scheme in this case. So as we can see, this car is not uh, doing that well, right? Uh, and that's after four thousand four hundred episodes. So let's just end this for now. Okay, we have this, okay, let me, okay, sorry, it crashed a bit from the color side as well, give me a second, so the next one we want to look at is the model that we trained after 5,000 episodes, how does it perform compared to after 4,400 episodes, right? And remember, this is only learning from images, right? So there are a lot of improvements that we could make. So let me run that one and see how it performs. So we initialize the simulator here. And let's initialize this model from the side and see. Okay. Here we go. So its control scheme seems to be a little better but it takes very wild turns, as we can see. And it ended there, okay. So it seems to have a, a bit smoother movement compared to what we were looking at, like after driving for, oh, there you go, it's going wild again. But there you go, it's back on the road, found a shortcut for itself. But this movement is quite interesting. And here I'm just trying to make it follow the road tangents that are defined by the waypoints and so on. But it hasn't collided yet, so that's actually progress, I suppose. And it makes a turn, that's great. And I think from here it actually went a bit wild. Well, it goes a bit wild, but let's see. Yep, it's gonna go in that direction and Right, so it obviously didn't learn for long enough because it's doing some pretty crazy things here, as we can see. Um, but let, yeah, let's just observe it for a little bit longer and see what happens. I mean, survive this long. Oh, okay, and the episode ended after that part. So yeah, that's the idea here behind this. Okay, let me stop this. So as you can see, like, of course, after 5,000 episodes, it learned to do like better movements compared to when we're looking at it from 4,400 episodes. So naturally you think if we train it for longer, it might learn like to move even much more smoothly. 
uh, but I didn't uh, go beyond that. So having said that, there are a lot of improvements we could make. So first of all, this car is only using images as input, but there are also other things we could incorporate in there, right? Because speed, for instance, is important when actually de determining like whether you should turn or whether you should not. And also like sometimes when you reach a corner, you want to slow down and all of that. But we are going to add all these extra variables to our state and stuff later on. But this was just to show you that just by an image, we can already have a like self-driving agent that performs well, decently well. And uh, of course, like I said, there are a lot of moving parts, but uh, there's also a lot of room for improvement, not only from our state representation, but also how we re represent our actions, right? Because we could, when we learn about this uh, policy gradient algorithms that output continuous values, they might perform better in this task uh, as such. So the algorithm we're using, our action space representation, our state representation, they could all be improved. But since we only looked at deep Q-learning algorithms, then uh, that's why I just used that method uh, since that's one we've covered so far. But we'll cover more reinforcement learning algorithms and we'll continue working on our self-driving agent to ensure that uh, we have a more like fun project to look at. So having said that, I'm going to end this lecture here. Uh, thank you for your time.